Hi, good afternoon. Welcome to NUS ISS Learning Festival. Okay, this segment is on AI governance, the responsible use of AI. I'm Brian, and together with me, co-presenting this segment is my colleague, Nicholas Tan. Okay, this is the agenda for this session. First, I'll give an introduction to AI and AI applications then move on to the considerations for developing AI models. Then my colleague, um, Nicholas Tan, he will present the good, bad and ugly of AI and also AI governance. Okay, first an introduction to AI itself. AI is a very big and broad term. There are several branches of AI. For example, the computer vision. So for computer vision, right, um, an example of it would be things like object detection and also object recognition from video and image data. Next, on the speech recognition, on speech recognition and processing, an example would be transcription from audio data. That means transcribing audio data to text. Then on the natural language processing, for natural language processing, right, an example would be like machine translation from one language to another language from text data. So we also have other branches of AI, for example, robotics, planning and optimization, evolutionary algorithms, reasoning systems, learning algorithms, knowledge representation, and also artificial emotional intelligence. So for artificial emotional intelligence, is about teaching AI how to read human emotions. Things like whether is the AI able to understand that a human is happy, sad, or angry. Okay, AI applications um, has found itself in many domains and is applicable in a lot and a wide variety of domains. Like for example, retail and F&B. In retail and F&B, right? One could actually make use of AI to maybe think, do things like forecast next month's sales so that um, there's more efficient optimization of resources. Then in the security domain, one could use computer vision to detect anomalies from video data such as surveillance or CCTV data. Then for social and lifestyle, a good example would be chatbots and virtual assistants. So things like um, Amazon Echo, Google Home, and Apple CV. So with so many um, AI applications and being used in a large variety of application domains, definitely everyone can make use of AI itself. So like for example, the government sector, the small medium enterprises, and also large enterprises such as the MNCs and organizations such as IHLs, the NGOs or charity organizations, etc., and also the consumers and citizens. Okay, more illustrations about AI applications. So locally, right, we are tapping on AI to better COVID-19. Then also, AI is being used in the medical domain, like for example, to diagnose brain tumor. So there's a competition between the AI itself and also human doctors. And the result of the competition is that AI is able to detect brain tumors at a much faster speed and also more accurately than the human doctors. So there's also a lot of um, articles about speech recognition technology. So an example is states that speech recognition technology is now as good as human transcribers and is able to achieve low error rate such as 5% error rate. And such error rate is actually on par with human transcribers. So there's a lot of optimisms and also a lot of good news and good results coming out from the AI applications itself. Okay, so what is the actual AI current state? 
what is achievable and not achievable by AI currently. So AI now still belongs very much to a stage of artificial narrow intelligence. So what um, does one mean by artificial narrow intelligence? It means to perform tasks within a very specific domain and for certain use cases only. And it's often used within certain boundaries and constraints. Then, um, is AI able to reach the goal of artificial general intelligence? Currently, it is still not able to reach the goal of artificial general intelligence although this is the goal that we would like AI to achieve. And what does one mean by artificial general intelligence? Artificial general intelligence generally means that the AI needs to be able to carry out tasks across several use cases, generalize its capability across various domains, and it must be almost human-like with intelligence, with the ability to perform acceptably in several general tasks. So currently, right, um, how far are we away from the goal of artificial general intelligence? So these are some of the questions that we might like to think about to see how far are we away from the goal itself of artificial general intelligence. So currently, some of the questions would be, is AI able to perform tasks without supervision and monitoring? Is AI able to think for cases not seen before and reacts accordingly? Then is AI able to generalize across various domains and tasks? And so whether is AI able to perform self-maintenance and upgrade? So like for example, for human, right? Human, um, we are able to perform self-maintenance and upgrade in the sense that when one, uh, like for example, when a person's hair gets long, then for human, we'll be able to go to the barber or salon to do self-maintenance. And also, if we want to upgrade our skill sets and capability, we are actually able to sign up for courses and gain the knowledge through the courses. But is AI able to perform such stuff, such as self-maintenance and upgrade automatically by themselves? Yeah. And also, is AI currently able to provide the human touch, the kind of emotional support that is required by human. Yep. So these are the questions that we might like to think about. Next, I'll move on to the considerations for developing AI models. And in the context of transparency, fairness and bias of AI models, audit and confidentiality of AI models, and also ethics of AI models. Okay, let's first start with transparency in AI models. Why is transparency in AI models important? It's important because when there's transparency in AI models, then human will have trust in the AI model itself. Then. The next question would be, when would human have trust in AI models? So some of the points to take note is given below. Like for example, when they know what is the decision taken by the AI model at each step. Then why did the AI model make the decision? And also, will the AI model make the same decision the next time? like given similar um, scenario. And what is the confidence of the decision made by the AI model? Is it 95% confident or is it just 60% confident? And eventually, right, if the decision given by the AI model itself is not correct, then can us as human correct the decision or can us as human know how to correct the decision that is made by the AI model. Okay, this illustrates an example of transparency and explainability AI, the contrasting difference between a black box model and a more understandable model. So on one side, 
on the left hand side, right, you have the deep learning model. So basically, you know the input that you fit into the model itself and also the output of the model. But the internal mechanism of the model itself is more like a black box. You do not actually know the exact internal working mechanism. Then on the other hand, on the right hand side, it shows a rule-based system. So over here, right, rule-based decisions are being used to make a decision or rule-based are being used to make a decision. And these rule-based systems, from the look of it, you know that it's more comprehensible and understandable by human. Yeah. So when a system is more comprehensible and more understandable, a human will have higher confidence in the decision made and also will have more trust in the model. Okay, next we shall talk about what is bias in AI. Okay, so the definition of bias in AI, right? What is it? So basically, bias in AI happens when AI model or algorithm discriminates against certain group. It produces undesirable outcomes and does not provide a fair assessment. So bias in AI may be detected at the output stage. However, it may not always be apparent unless enough use cases were presented and analysis being made. But then, is bias caused at the output stage only? Or is it caused by much earlier stages in the AI modeling? So basically, a lot of times, right, biases could be due to much earlier stages such as the data collection stage, where when the data collected is not representative of the population and it lacks diversity. Okay, what could have gone wrong in this example? So in this example, right, an Asian man tries to renew his passport and he uploaded his photo to the New Zealand passport renewal system. However, when he uploaded the photo, he got an error message. The error message actually states that the photo you want to upload does not meet our criteria because the subject eyes are closed. So what could have gone wrong in this example? Could it be a case of the training data not being representative? Could it be a case of the training data not being diverse enough? So this is something for us to think about. Okay, next, going into the AI audit. So AI audit is important because it enforces trust in the user of AI. And it also encourages transparency, accountability, and responsibility in the maker of the AI model. And audit itself will provide an independent and unbiased view on the AI model developed and also provides certain level of assurance to the AI users. It also serves to address questions such as, is there a bias in the model? Are there any ethical issues in the modeling of the AI model? Like for example, whether um, one that may cause harm to human is being encoded in the model itself? And also, is there a structure and process in place for data access? who is actually authorized to assess the data that is being collected? And is there a governance in place on who can modify the model? Who is actually authorized to modify the model? And also, does the model perform within certain level of confidence? That means, is the model robust enough? Then on the topic of AI confidentiality, we'll be looking from two perspectives. The first perspective, right, would be from the user perspective. Then the next one would be from the owner perspective. So from the user perspective, definitely the user would want to be informed of the data that's being collected. And the user also wants to have the option to opt in or opt out of the data collection. And the usage of the data that's being collected, whether is it 
for a specific purpose only. And the AI model that is created will actually benefit the user and will not be used to harm the user. Also, from a user perspective, right, they also expect certain levels of clarifications to be provided by the maker of AI at request. Next, moving to the AI owner perspective. So definitely from the AI owner perspective, the AI owner would want to gain trust from the user of AI. So AI is a valuable asset and also needs to be protected. And as much as the AI owner likes to perform AI audit, right? But it has to be done to an extent that no confidential information is being reviewed. And the AI owner also needs to protect the AI algorithms so that the details are not being leaked to the competitors and also to prevent AI algorithms from being exploited and attacked. Okay, last but not least, um, we will discuss on the AI ethics. So first, I'd like to introduce to you the three laws of robotics. So this is a, quite a famous laws within the robotics community is actually fictitious, meaning that um, it's actually drawn out from novel itself. But these three laws of robotics is rather interesting. Okay, on the first law, right, it states, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction, allow a human being to come to harm. Then the second law states that a robot must obey the orders given it by human beings except where such orders would conflict with the first law. Then the third law states that a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second laws. So it's, these three laws are rather interesting and something to think about. And like, for example, the first law, right, it actually states a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. So are we actually able to encode such high level uh, laws or regulation within a robot? Yep. So this can be something to think about. And also what other considerations in AI ethics that we would like to consider? First, can we actually prevent misuse of AI by malicious individuals or by malicious organizations? And whether is AI able to take into consideration moral values? And also, how much human intervention is required in the deployment of AI? Okay, um, next, I will hand it over to my colleague, Nicholas. He will be talking on the topic, the good, bad, and ugly of AI, and also AI governance. Yep. Thanks, Brian. Okay, good afternoon. Brian has talked about all the good stuff of how to develop an AI system, an AI model, and what are the considerations when developing an AI model. So what I'm going to cover next is examples of AI models in use, the good, the bad, and the ugly. With anything new, when people do not have a history of using a particular technology, there will be instances where they use it in a good way, in a bad way, in an ugly way. Let's take a look at some of these examples. So what you see on the slide here, there are two examples of good use of AI systems. On the left is actually an app, or Benwa. Actually, I may be massacring the pronunciation because it's a Nigerian phrase. But what it does is to record the cry of a baby. Um, a baby that has just been born for a short while in essence, perinatal um, cries of babies. What it does is it listens to the sound of the baby and predicts whether or not the baby has a condition that is called perinatal asphyxia. What is perinatal asphyxia? It's actually one of the top three causes of infant mortality in the world today. Annually, it causes death of 1.2 million infants. And even if it doesn't result in death, the same number of infants will suffer lifelong disabilities. So it is a very pernicious and very harmful 
disease that this application is trying to help to prevent. Or on the right hand side, you will notice that there is this security scanner. If you travel, you go to the airports, before you step in, you will step into a scanner and usually it's pretty slow. And when you walk past, you have metal, for example, on your body, it will beep and then someone will come along and warn you from top to bottom. That's pretty old technology. With this new technology, what it does is you step through and instantly, based on AI, it's able to tell where on your body there could be dangerous substances, dangerous equipment. And it's smart enough that it learns over time. So it could be put in on day one. But over time, it learns through patterns of people stepping through what are potential dangers. And it can be coupled with a facial recognition system where beyond just scanning the bodies based on your facial features, it's able to predict whether there is a dangerous situation. And the volume of people stepping through, you can step through at normal pace. So it's pretty high compared to the older technology. So these are the good users of AI that we have in existence today. It's, it's, it's not in the lab, it's something in existence today. What about the bad? Killer robots. Movies have been talking about killer robots since forever. Most famous example, Terminator, hunted killer robots sent from the future to hunt down a human being in the present so that the human being doesn't exist in the future. Well, you don't have to look into the movies to look for such killer robots. If you look at a picture, you will see a gun. This is actually an automated weapon system from a famous rifle manufacturer, Kalashnikov. What it's able to do is you can give it the ability to locate human targets. You can even tell it to select specific human targets. And most dangerous of all, open fire on the human target. Again, it is not something science fiction, it is not something in a movie, it exists today. It's the only weapons manufacturer that actually sells it, as in, this is what we have. It's the only manufacturer that says it has this. But actually, if you look at all the weapon systems out there, the autonomous weapon systems, whether they're used for search and rescue, whether they're used for logistics, Actually turning a robot into a hunter-killer robot is just a software update away. It is just that the conventions of warfare today does not allow arms manufacturer to come out and say, we actually have a hunter-killer robot, but it is in existence today. The last example, this is a snapshot from a, a movie, a 2019 movie. The movie is titled Anon. It's really a movie. We don't really have this today in what the movie portrays, but we have something similar. Let me explain this movie to you. What happens is this is set in a surveillance kind of society. So besides cameras, people's eyes are used as recording devices. So what you see, your point of view, every citizen that is, what you see gets sent to an information hive. And then the police, at will, is able to call up all those visuals from the point of view of any citizen. So they can say what happened at this particular point in time with this person, and they can view what has happened. Not using a screen, not using a computer, but actually in their consciousness, based on their own point of view. And on top of that, based on recognition, when you are viewing the images, actually there's overlay. The life history of the individual gets shown next to the individual. It could be an individual, it could be a building, it could be a device. It's like you are immersed in that situation. Now, you might think this is a movie. We don't have this today. But if you look at urban environment today, in fact, many urban environments in the Asia Pacific. Most urban environments are highly, highly installed with cameras. The per capita count of camera installation is going up day by day by day. In fact, eight of the 10 top urban environments in the world today, the last count, is actually in Asia Pacific.
Now, these cameras will take visual images of people. It in itself may not be that harmful, but coupled with facial recognition software, coupled with the exploding capacity of processing by hardware, you actually can have a real-time surveillance system. And actually, if you go and Google out there, there are many urban environments today that does have an urban, real-time surveillance system. Now, how do you essentially make sure all these practices, whether they're good, whether they're bad, whether they're ugly, as is right now, how do you make sure they all converge to something that will, in essence, bring well-being to humans? and not to bring harm to humans. Well, many governments, many nations, people in academia, people in industry, what they've said is, we need good AI governance. So again, many nations, many industries, many practitioners have actually come up and articulated for themselves how they would see themselves being governed in the use of AI. As it is right now, it's still pretty nascent. Not many localities actually make this legislation, make this regulation. More often than not, these are optional. But it is a starting place. We need to have a good set of guidance in the form of AI governance that tells people how to practice the use of AI in such a way that it will benefit humankind and not the other way around. So this is an example of a particular AI governance framework. If it looks familiar to you, yes it is, it's actually um, created by PDPA, or rather PDPC, with IMDA, with SGD in collaboration. So this is Singapore's model AI framework, second edition. In essence, what it states is a set of aspirations in terms of behavior of how to use AI well. There are other examples of AI governance framework. Other people beyond articulating aspirations what they have tried to establish is this. How do you take these aspirations and overlay it against the actual organizational practices to make sure that AI governance is well practiced? So I overlay such two examples side by side. And you can see where all these aspirations can actually appear within the organizational practices in order to make sure that there's good AI practices within the organization. Now, overlaying is one thing. It, again, is pretty high level. When you're trying to execute, how do you say, well, this process I have, I need to have this particular behavior as dictated by AI governance. So when people try to practice AI governance, what they normally do is to get a handle on what is the governance operating model that they have to design for the operation. What is an operating model? If you look on the left bottom, it is but a visualization of the organization's operations to deliver value to its customers. In simple terms, in the simplest form, it is but a value delivery chain. Against that value delivery chain, you will have certain other practices like, for example, leadership and talent, infrastructure, oversight, governance, um, structures that you put in place to make sure that all the activities in the value delivery chain are done in the way that your governance model says it should be practiced. So you have to take the governance framework, you have to look at your governance operating model, and you have to look at every delivery chain that you have in the delivery of AI to make sure that you have designed it properly. And that all the aspirations define your AI governance actually leads to being executed. Now, again, having said that, how do you actually do it? There are many ways to design operating models. This is one example, using an operating model canvas. Model canvas, sounds very familiar, right? Something that's similar to the business model canvas? Well, it is. Not the business model canvas, but it makes use of concepts within the business model canvas. If you look at this particular canvas, you will see six elements. I use the acronym P-O-L-I-S-M. So processes, organizations, locations, information, suppliers, management system. These six elements are actually, I would say, a 
expanded perspective of three elements in the business model canvas. And that's the key resources, key partners, and key activities. But they look at this, particularly this canvas, in a more detailed fashion using the polism acronym, the six elements. It will give you a very much more detailed look in terms of what are the activities that you are doing to deliver that product or solution, in this case, an AI product or solution. Now, you might have many value delivery chains in terms of AI solutions within your organization because you might be using AI in many places within your organization. So what happens is you have to have a canvas for each and every one of these value delivery chains. And at the end of the day, you aggregate, you consolidate, and then you rationalize to understand what are the elements of governance that you bring to your organization. Where does all these design land at the end of the day? Here, just prior to changing your organization to make sure that you can execute against the kinds of governance aspirations that you have, against the operating model design that you have determined based on all the value delivery chains of AI that you have enumerated within your organization. Now, governance is just one component, just one component of practices within an organization. There are many other practices within your organization. I call them a system of practices. So beyond governance, what else do you practice in your organization? You practice risk. You practice compliance, not just necessarily for AI, but for many other practices. For example, data. For example, um, cybersecurity. For example, uh, delivery of digital technology. The thing is, this system of practices needs to be done holistically. It cannot be silos. You cannot be practicing governance by itself, risk by itself. You cannot be practicing AI governance. You cannot be practicing data governance by themselves in silos. At some point in time, they have to synergize, right? So that's what we call AI GLC, AI governance, risk, and compliance. Now, why look at this system of practice? Why look at it from the perspective of GRC? GRC is a pretty mature practice in most organizations. It is a core element of corporate governance. But here we're looking at it from an AI perspective. Now, if you look at the two fragments I've extracted from Alphabet, from Microsoft, that's extracted from their annual report. The annual report to their own um, kind of um, corporate regulators. But in essence, what they say is this. AI is more and more being used in their products and services, in their offerings. But they feel that the risk of AI, whether it's technological, whether it's legal, whether it's ethical, it is big risk. It is big risk to the operations of their organizations. Now, this complexity and these growing concerns are not just for these big these two big organizations. Most organizations practicing the use of AI in whatever industries, in healthcare, in finance, are very wary and concerned that the complexity of AI could potentially result in harmful effects to their customers and ultimately to themselves. And therefore, all these concerns are leading to calls for something we call AI oversight. What actually is AI oversight. AI oversight is essentially looking at AI holistically. You can't just look at AI governance in and of itself. A large core component of AI is data because contemporary AI is mostly about machine learning. Machine learning is able to do its learning because of the copious data that is available. So besides AI governance, the good practice of data hygiene is very important. And that's the practice of data governance. Now, data governance, AI governance, again, in and of themselves, they are good practices. But the world as it is today, organizations, nations even, individuals, under attack all the time. And what does this mean? 
beyond the governance of data and AI, we have to look at cybersecurity. But why do people attack you? Why do you get cyber attacked? For two reasons. People want to take things from you, that's your data. Or people want to make things unavailable to you. Unavailable in the sense that they want to make things not work. Ransomware, for example. Or not work in the sense that they essentially make your data untrusted. So for example, if you have an AI system that's based on some data and the data is untrusted, the decisions of those AI systems are untrusted. So the practice of cybersecurity hygiene is also very important. So we have the governance, we have the risk. And last, if you're a big organization, it is not that you are only looking at one particular locality. The world today as it is, big organizations have to look around the world, whether it's for data, whether it's for AI. Different localities have different requirements. Different localities have different regulations. So a practice that is okay today here may not be okay tomorrow there. So legal governance is something that's very important. You have to understand the jurisdiction that you're practicing in. What is acceptable? What is not acceptable? The models that you create, right? The decisions that your models come to, the kind of explanations that you have to offer to your customers, to your consumers, different legislations will require you to do different things. One solution does not fit every locality in the world, potentially. So you have to understand. And because this is a nascent field, things are changing. Things are changing constantly. What you do today may not be relevant in six months' time, in 12 months' time, in a different locality. So in total, that's what we call AI oversight. AI governance in itself, it covers a quite a fair ground, but in itself is not sufficient. Looking at AI risk, looking at AI compliance, again, is good. It's a wider coverage, AI GRC, but again, it's not necessarily sufficient. AI oversight, when you look at it holistically, including data governance, including AI and cybersecurity legal governance, is a situation that you probably would want to establish in such a way that you have a holistic perspective on what is necessary to practice good AI use within your organization. Good in the sense that it will result in well-being for humans and not just for profits. Now, with that, come to the end of my session. Thank you very much. And we're going to take some questions now. Let me invite Brian back so that we can answer questions together. Brian? Yep. Hello. Yeah. Um, there's a few questions that came in. So I will um, attempt to answer a few of the questions. Okay, for the first question that I'd like to answer, right, is the question is, for deep neural network, it's often said it's a black box solution, and we don't know what goes inside the box to turn out the solution. Then who knows the mechanism inside since it's built or algorithm is written by somebody? Does it involve very complex mathematical or scientific methodologies. So um, before I answer this question, right, so let me just briefly um, describe how a neural network or um, black box model is being trained. So for a neural network, right, generally there's a forward pass and also a backward pass. In the forward pass training, the data input will be multiplied by the weights, then the aggregated um, the aggregated data, right, it actually goes through a function. So that's the forward pass. Then after that, in the backward pass, right, one would try to minimize the error or the residual of the weights itself. So all this will involve very, very um, complex mathematical expressions. Yep. So who knows the mechanism inside it, right? It will be the creator of the neural network itself, the creator of the model itself. Then does it involve very complex mathematical and scientific methodologies? Yes, it's all about the, the math insight. Yep. So over here, right, what we want to um, state in terms of having more explainable AI, right, is to have the working mechanisms 
to be more understandable and also comprehensible by human itself. So for a neural network, right, a lot is represented in terms of numbers and also complex uh, mathematical equations. So this, in a way, is not so understandable and also, in a way, not so comprehensible by human. Okay, um, let me just uh, answer another question. Okay, another question is, who will be responsible for formulating AI governance, rules and regulations, government or private AI organizations? Okay, my opinion is that, like, um, within a country, right, definitely the government would be responsible for formulating AI governance, but this is not done in silo. So the government would actually seek um, consultations with private organizations or even draw reference from overseas. Yep. Then within an organization itself, so on top of adhering to the country's uh, law and regulations, the organization itself right, can also implement the detailed processes of AI governance. Okay, so I hope um, I've answered these two questions. So um, Nicholas, over to you. Okay, before I answer the two questions, let me add on to what Brian said about who, who essentially um, uh, determines AI governance. Very few countries in the world actually have embedded AI governance as part of their um, legislation. In fact, very few. Um, so for countries where governments do not essentially come up with regulations or with laws, by far, most companies actually do not have AI governance practice today. It's pretty nascent. Although big companies do have their own articulation. Example, in the US, there's no law on AI governance, but big organizations like Microsoft have clearly defined what it is that they practice with AI governance. In Singapore, even though the government has come up with uh, this framework, it's still optional. Organizations do not necessarily need to do any AI governance within their uh, businesses. But in Singapore, we have a regulator in the financial industry that says that you have to essentially adhere to this set of principles that are very closely related to our model AI governance framework. So it's, 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 a, matter of, it's a matter of how big a risk it is that you consider governing AI use in your organization it is to you as a business. If you think the risk is high, then it is good practice for you to embed it in your governance practice today. Okay, just wanted to add a bit to that. Um, let me answer this question. Which companies have adopted the AI framework mentioned in, or rather, which companies have adopted the model AI framework? Well, if you go and take a look at PDPC website, you will see quite a few case studies. There's a long list of case studies um, actually described by PDPC. Now, those are the organizations that have, in a way, implemented aspects of the model AI framework. That's one. Now, number two, MAS, our regulator in the financial industry, has actually got a set of principles, FEAT, Fairness, ethics, accountability, transparency. Again, by and large, it's modeled very, very closely around the model AI framework. Now, that's not law, but that's regulations. And anybody in that particular industry will have to, in a way, practice or comply with this set of regulations. And if they comply, in a way, by and large, they have essentially implemented the model AI framework. Hope that answers your question. Let me take one more. And then I'll pass to Brian for another question if there's time. Okay. Currently, is there a global organization that governs AI in all aspects? Design, implementation, users, ethics, etc. If no any organization that is close to it, the answer is actually no. It's very fragmented. Governance is essentially a set of practices and rules with responsibilities and accountability to essentially prescribe good behavior. Now, different locations, different industries, different businesses, they all have different ideas as to what good practice is all about. Also, there's the economic factor to be considered. So the disparate space we're in today, the nascent 
considerations and understanding about AI governance that that is still a far way from having a, a central organization uh, that will prescribe what AI governance is all about. Okay. Now, I think over okay. to you, Brian, for yep. the next question. Yep. Thanks, Nicholas. Okay, there's another question. Um, the question states, if the industry is heavily evidence-based, like healthcare, can clinical systems tap onto neural network to aid clinical decision-making? If yes, how can medical practitioners explain the outcomes of neural network to patients or the doctors will decide based on prioritizing neural network outcomes versus clinical judgment? Okay, so for, for this right, um, actually neural networks, things like um, the CNN, convolutional neural network, has been used very much um, for like diagnosing um, medical imaging for computer vision kind of um, applications. So one thing to take note over here is that usually for AI, AI is not to um, replace humans. AI is not used to replace human judgment. So a lot of times, right, like for example, for clinical system, a lot of times a human in the loop is still required. So the human or the doctors and the clinicians will still have a final say on the outcome of the decision that is made by the AI itself. So with that, I hope I have addressed this question. Okay, yeah. So with that, um, thank you for joining us for this um, learning festival. So with that, I will end this segment. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you.